1987, Alan Bloom conducted a study. He wrote a best-selling book entitled The Closing of American Mind. And he told us some things then that we were not very pleased to hear. He approached some young people, some young adults, and he asked them to describe in their minds who is evil. Who is evil in your way of thinking? And very quickly they named Adolf Hitler. And of course, who could argue against that? But what his book revealed and what the study told us is they couldn't go much beyond that answer. And what he came to realize and told us is that many times Americans struggle with declaring something to be evil. And they struggle with declaring those who do evil things. And it has a fancy word attached to it, relativism. But sometimes we have trouble describing that and determining that. There is something that's right, and there are some things that are wrong. And Romans chapter 7 encourages us to come to that reality this morning. I realize in order to be true to myself, I need to begin the sermon this morning slightly different than maybe I normally would. I need to go again to John chapter 3 and read verses 17 through 18. We're talking about sin and we're against it. And we talk about it in a way that reminds us that we need to be redemptive. It's one of the words that I have taken to heart in recent decades. Be certain that everything we say is redemptive. There, yes, there is a hell, and we need to make people aware of that, but there's also heaven. And we want people to go to heaven, but we must make them aware of the other side of that coin, and Scripture forces that upon us, whether we like it or not. John 3, verse 17, For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. And let's not stop there because the verse also says, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Mankind stands condemned before God without Jesus Christ. If we think we're doing a favor by not making them aware of that which would be wrong in their life, in their thoughts, in their actions, if we think we're doing them a favor, not telling them that perhaps they need to understand the life they're living and where it may put them for eternity, we're not doing them a favor. They stand condemned already, John 3 verse 18 tells us. The belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and then our acting upon that belief gives us the opportunity to no longer stand condemned before God. I ask myself often, and I'm answering that question again today, how do we approach Scripture when we come together? There are many, Alan Bloom's book would tell us, that want to come to worship services and not talk about sin not cause people to be uneasy about their life. Let them come in here and leave, leave feeling as if everything is okay. And how can we do that if everything is not okay? And yet there are huge religious bodies of believers in our world today and in America today that believe their number one goal when you come together is make this a safe place and never talk about sin. Never acknowledge sin when we come together. And I can't do that if I care about your soul. Now I need to acknowledge that on a Sunday morning the majority of us have responded to Christ as the resurrected Savior. We've responded to the fact that we realize there's sin in our life and we have the ability to do something about it. 
and we were immersed in water in order to have sins forgiven, we give that sin to God and it's no longer remembered. It's as far from us and from God as the east is from the west. But there are times when we come together, we must develop a certain posture in our use of Scripture. And we get that from 2 Peter, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 3, and it begins with the statement about Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed, it's inspired of God, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And if you go to 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, or verse 2, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. And he, re he repeats two of the uses of Scripture. We need to correct, and we need to rebuke, and we need to encourage. So when we come to Scripture, we need to teach and rebuke and correct and train each of us to live in righteousness, and we need to encourage. All of them are important. All of them are necessary for us to live faithfully in this fallen world. Thank you, Justin, again for your prayer and that reminder. This fallen world in which we live, and yet we come together, and we want to be taught that which is right. And we want to encourage each other. And we want to teach God's word. But sometimes it involves correcting. Maybe making right some of the teachings we've received to be certain that we understand it correctly. And of course, rebuking is a hard word in some ways. And yet the Hebrew writer told us that the father disciplines his son because he loves him. And those statements we're using to describe God. Our Father disciplines us because He loves us. And there's that correction that sometimes is necessary in life. We've given the title to this lesson from Romans chapter 7 for sermon's sake. Why did God give us the law? Why do we have the law? And one of the reasons it's given is so that we can be made aware of what's right and wrong in our world. And Paul discusses, and we looked at it in class, the struggle that we go through. We know what's right and we strive to do it, and we find ourselves not following through. And he says, the things I want to do, I can't do. I don't do. I find myself not doing them. And the things that I know I should be doing, I find myself doing just the opposite. We don't always act the way we know we ought to act. And we don't always stay away from the things that God warns us about that could put our soul in jeopardy. We don't always follow through and be as strong in those areas as we would like to do. And as I told the class this morning, I think I repeated it at least three times, we all go through that as we go through our lives as Christians. We all struggle with doing what's right day by day. We struggle with different things. The years that we have in Christ will struggle maybe a little bit less, but we will still struggle to do that which is right before God. And we have, from Romans 7, words from Paul to give us an idea about why we have those directions. I'm going to use the commands probably more often than the law because that's how it would apply to us today. Why did the Jews have the Old Testament law? That's what's being discussed to Christians who were Jewish in their background. Why did they have the law? We know from Paul's example, we know from studying Phariseeism many weeks ago now, that many religious Jewish people believe that the law made it possible for them to declare themselves righteous before God. They could look at themselves and say, well, I don't steal, I don't murder, I haven't committed adultery, 
and they go through a list of those Old Testament new, uh, Ten Commandments, and they could beat themselves on the chest and say, well, look at me, I'm doing pretty well. And God, are you noticing what I'm doing and how I'm doing it? Paul goes to the sin of coveting. And one writer made the observation, maybe because it's the one that goes straight to the heart. When Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount, he told us it's not committing adultery alone. It's maybe thinking and lusting after a person in your heart. It's not just the outward, it's the inward. It may be something that you don't overtly do, but is your heart sinning as it would lust after someone or covet something that someone else would want? You don't act on it, but does the sin of coveting, is that part of your thinking? Is it part of your mindset? If you could get away with it, would you do it? And he says, I didn't know it was a sin to covet. I didn't know that until I was told. And he says, once I knew it, and he uses specific words, verse 7, uh, he says, the law says do not covet, and I would not have known what it was to covet except for the law in verse 8. But sin seizes the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in me every kind of covetous desire for apart from law, sin is dead. That's a hard phrase for some to understand unless you put it in the context that Paul has just put it. He did not know it was a sin to covet. And then he did. But because his fallen nature would be given to the reality of I shouldn't do that, but now that I know I shouldn't do it, there's something within me that wants to. There's something that sin is taking the opportunity of this knowledge to lead me to want to do that. And as I said in class and can only say it in a better way, wet paint. Wet paint. You're walking along, you're a hundred feet from a bench, but there's a sign that says the paint is wet, do not touch. And there's something in the nature of some people that want to go over there and touch it. Knowing they shouldn't, sin takes the opportunity, using Paul's words, to want to go check it out, to go touch it. Well, how can you tell me I can't touch it? What if it's dry? I need to be sure. I need to know what my position might be, depending on what I find when I go over there to see if it's still wet. And there's some among us that are given to that way of thinking. Knowing something, the opportunity from within is kindled to want to consider doing it, to wanting to check it out. And of course, Satan is going to tell us at the same time, you can get away with it. No one will see you. And you kind of look around to be sure. Or it's not that bad, whatever it might be. And if you do it, remember, you just need to ask God to forgiveness. You ask for that forgiveness. So it's okay. And that's playing games with sin, using forgiveness as a game. Paul is telling us sin is deadly. It leads to spiritual death. And the reality is knowing that something is wrong, sometimes there's something within us that wants to do it. Before, we may not have known it. But knowing it, there's something within us sometimes seeing, seizing the opportunity moves us toward that action or that thought. And so he's reminding us. And then he says, for apart from law, sin is dead. Now, he's not saying there's no such thing as sin. So we need to understand what's been said before to understand what might be said here. 
We know last week we saw that before Moses gave the law, there was sin in the world. And it began with Adam and Eve, and it continued. And we know in the story of Noah, the world as a whole was doing evil most of the time. And God decided, I'm going to destroy mankind, and I'm going to save eight, and start again because he repented. He changed his mind about mankind. And sin had taken over. So we know there was sin before, and we know it was active in the Old Testament. We know there were people who were breaking laws before the Ten Commandments. And we certainly know that there are those that were without the law, we saw in Romans 2, that their conscience became their law. So the things we know, let's not let them help us to explain a statement that might be a little strange to us. What he's going to show us in Romans chapter 7 is sin is dead as far as our thinking, as far as our thinking about it, as far as our willingness or wanting to act upon it. Except law tells us what's right or wrong. So without knowing something is right or wrong, Sin's not in, uh, active within us. It's actually dead, he would suggest. But then it comes alive. And he uses coveting as the example. When I was told it was wrong, I didn't know it before. When I was told that, suddenly I find myself thinking about it and doing it from time to time. Sin took the opportunity, knowing the law, and sin was no longer dead as it spoke to that action of coveting. It's suddenly all I could think about, my words, as he would describe what I wanted to do or what I didn't want to do, and I found myself doing just the opposite. Just the opposite. Now, lest I forget, I don't think I would, but I want to be certain. Paul made statements about that law when he goes to verse 12, Romans 7, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. We can't blame the knowledge of right and wrong for leading us away from that which we ought to do. The law came from God, so it was good, it was holy, it was righteous. We can't put something on the law that's not proper because it had a purpose, and its origin came from a loving, holy God who wanted nothing but our good, and who wants to declare us righteous. But he needs us to know what's right and what's wrong. He needs that to be absolutely clear. And that's where many large religious groups in our world totally are missing the boat I do not want to go to a spiritual doctor, let me use that terminology for someone who might be teaching in a large group that doesn't ever want to talk about sin. I don't want to be in front of a spiritual doctor who doesn't tell me my spiritual condition before God. If I need rebuking, I need him to rebuke me. If I'm condemned to eternal loss, I need to know the answer to be able to change that condition. But I don't need to do that all the time. There are so much, so many things that we need to choose to talk about to encourage Christian living, to warn us, to give us steps, if you will, to do better day by day, to acknowledge that we're all going through this war of trying to do what's right when we know what's right, and to not do that which is wrong when we know what's wrong. But at the end of the day, we have to admit we messed up again. What I said or did was the opposite of what I intended. The book, Alan Bloom, the closing of the American mind is something that's found its way into our culture. It's found its way into some of our religious gatherings. 
and it's not something we should be very pleased about. When I was growing up, second of nine children, there were times I needed my hands banged. And I use that metaphorically, but maybe even with clarity, usually turn your hand over and the teacher in the elementary age at that time would take out a ruler and just put the ruler to your hand to get your attention to encourage you to do better. You need to quit talking when I'm talking. You need to raise your hand and be quiet when others are talking. There are times in very immature circumstances of our life when we did not do what we knew to do and someone impressed it upon us. Discipline from its root word is teaching. We need to teach people and disciplining sometimes has different methods by which we teach people. But the goal is instruction, to understand right from wrong. And we should beg for teachers like that. We should beg to have coaches like that who will instruct us so that we can achieve the highest of goals in our life, wherever and whatever it is we're wanting to achieve. I want that person who cares deeply about me to show it by disciplining me, instructing, by correcting, by rebuking, and at the end of the day, encouraging, teaching, training in righteousness, to use Paul's words. We need people like that. And we ought to run far away from those who don't care enough about us to tell us those things physically, spiritually, about our life. Four years of cross country and track in high school, I kept a scrapbook, did a few good things in those years. Later, when I went into sports riding, I had the opportunity to get an eight by 10 picture of my track coach. I still have it, it's falling apart, the, the scrapbook. But on the front page of that scrapbook is Coach Davis's picture. Who I was as an athlete, I attributed so much to how much he wanted me to be successful. And he yelled instructions from time to time. He gave me times that weren't pleasant to hear, but I needed to run a little faster on the 660 on a Thursday with a meet on Friday night. I was thankful for that person who made me who I was in that circumstance of life. But it's not always someone who's knocking you down. I don't need just rebuking. I don't need just correcting. I need someone to come alongside and maybe pat me on the back, encourage, and tell me I'm making progress. And you keep making progress, you'll do better. That's the process of knowing the law, knowing the consequences of not obeying those commands, and the process or the environment that Scripture produces for us in order to be that person who is righteous before God, based upon God's declaration and not my own. We saw in our study of Phariseeism a number of months ago now, of that Pharisee who stood with a sinner just over here, the sinner couldn't look up to heaven. He was so covered up in his humbleness, he couldn't look to heaven as he was praying a very good prayer. The self-righteous Pharisee, look at me, and I'm so thankful I'm not like him. And I'm not, not like those that you made a list of things that sinners do. And I'm thankful I'm not like them. And I'm thankful every morning the Pharisee would get up. And I'm thankful every morning I'm not a Gentile. I'm not a woman. But the things he said and the things he did in Phariseeism, they declared themselves self-righteous. 
And Jesus taught against it over and over and over again. Their feeling about themselves. And they're standing before God based on what they did. That's the concept of law. A law-keeping system and the abuse of it. Romans 7 teaches us the reality of it. It makes us aware that we're in need of a Savior. <coughs> and whatever can be said or done by people who care about my soul, if it directs me to a loving, patient, godly person and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior, it's a good thing that is happening in my life. Alan Bloom would suggest that many times we've done this in our life. We've come up with a new name for things like pornography or a new definition or a new outlook toward it. The attitude of a person who's trying to excuse it, who says, well, everybody looks at that stuff, and I'm not hurting anyone, and I've never cheated on my wife, as if to justify it. The person with a violent temper, knowing they should not be given in to that, don't end a day with anger between you and someone. But the response is, well, I didn't hurt them, I just told them off. A little bit excusing anger we can make all manner of excuses to help ourselves to feel better about the things we're compromising and choosing to do in our life which scripture and the commands would tell us don't be that kind of person and we talked briefly it wasn't planned but I need to mention something that came up in class today. What's the habit of our life? That's what 1 John 1 verses 5 to 7 talk about. Are you walking in the light? It's the habit of your life. We're going to fall short often. But what's the habit of your life? Are you angry all the time? Is that the habit of your life, knowing that sin with anger go hand in hand? Knowing that anger inwardly can become outward killing of a person? Oh, I wouldn't kill anybody, but boy, I can really be angry and kill them off intellectually, emotionally, by the inner man. That's what Jesus taught us against. It's not just the outward actions, it's the inward thoughts that make it just as sinful as Christians. It encourages us to be open and to be transparent and to be honest with ourselves as people are providing the instruction, the rebuking, the correction, and it's their way of encouraging us to be more and more like Jesus Christ. Are we more like Christ day by day? Is the habit of my life striving to be the very best that I can be? We're going to make mistakes and we're going to sin. And when we confess those sins, first John 1 verse 9, God is faithful and just and will forgive us that sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We need the law. We need the awareness because it gives us an accountability that's part of the Christian walk. The law wasn't sinful because it made us aware of things that were right or wrong. The law was holy, it was good, it was righteous. But it made us aware of things we needed to be aware of, and it made us certainly aware that I need a Savior. I can't deal with sin in my way and make it God's way. 
I must respond to a resurrected Savior. And as we're immersed in water, he deals with our sin at that time. And as I die to sin through that resurrection, I strive day by day to do better day by day. And I confess that sin and make it right, very aware, very knowledgeable, and very transparent. I'm not hiding it because God already knows about it. This morning, redemptive, we want to offer opportunities to make things right, to come to God, to Christ, as you would come to be part of that spiritual family, or to make right on actions that others would know about, public sin, or maybe just to ask for prayers to things otherwise we would not know about, and you're willing to make them known, and ask specific for prayers in certain areas. We gladly, don't excuse it at all, we gladly want to offer an opportunity to respond. And the best way to do it is to sing a song and give you that opportunity. Let's do that while we stand and sing. The cross upon 